Welcome everyone and sorry for the delay. Uh, today's session will be with uh, Pille Bonnell. We're very happy to have her here with us today. Uh, Pille is a systems ecologist and second order cybernetician with a passion for education as her contribution to the sustainability of Earth. Uh, after finishing her doctorate's studies in Berkeley half a century ago, she began her professional life as a research associate at the University of British Columbia, followed by nearly two decades as an international environmental consultant. She became engaged with complex systems through the American Society for Cybernetics, where she has served as president and is currently on the board. She has taught postgraduate courses in systems methods and system thinking, mostly at Royal Roads University. Pilla is particularly interested in the implications of how we think and act, especially how the assumptions we make and the beliefs we hold about reality change what is possible. In her presentation today, Pilla will be talking about ways in which the terminology we use in systemic design theories and practice affect our work and how we can do designing in language while also including an awareness of what falls in the spaces between distinctions and that which matters in unnamed dimensions. Uh, over to you, Pilla. Very happy to be here and to be able to hear your presentation. I am very happy to be here too, except I have just found another technical glitch. The screen share button has once again disappeared. And I'm wondering whether I have to just sign in again to find it. Uh, what do you recommend? Can see your screen. So I, if, I think if you start the presentation, it will work. Uh, you are seeing my main, you are seeing the screen with the moss on it? Yes. Ah, okay. Then, then I can just start. So now you see the presentation? Yes. Oh, excellent. So the title as I had given it was Language as a Hidden Constraint, but I'd like to change it to Language as an Enabling Constraint because though things are hidden, language is also so important in what we are able to do. And I always like to give thanks for all the many conversations I have had over the decades with a lot of people in the system sciences and design group and, and others everywhere. And always I give a tribute to Umberto Maturama, my mentor and friend who no longer is with us. And one of the things he pointed out is that every distinction reveals the regularity in the experience and obscures others. That those are the two aspects that must be kept in mind. So let's say we're just looking at a piece of ground on the, this, this was on a field in England and we see something, we pay attention to them. Oh, I'm seeing some rabbit pellets. And then as you pay attention to that, everything else can fade into the background. And this is analogous to the way making a distinction obscures other, it's as if they, those possibilities or what we might also have singled out, like the, the bits of lichen or the green mosses, they just kind of disappear into the background. And so it is with the various words that we create that have to do with design. Each one of them has the ability to reveal some regularity, something that's consistent and coherent in our experience, and at the same time obscures other things. And then particular because these preference have, have no intent, no tangible thing that we can point to and give to each other as a, as a thing. They are, although they get treated as things, they don't act entirely as things in our distinctions. So I'm going to put this presentation in there several sections. We're going to talk about chunking, what we do, what we do, flexibility of language, how we are structurally coupled and entangled, and I'm using that word liberally here, systemic cognition, and how we might navigate the betweens and domains that I will have talked about. So putting my toe in the water, let's start with chunking and betweens. This goes to a story. When I had a sabbatical in Estonia about 
2001, we're talking to a family. I saw this little less than two year old climbing up some concrete stairs and aren't you worried about them falling down? And no, the man tupli, he's tupli. And tupli is a word that happens in Estonian, but on English. And when I talked to the mother and said that, she said, how on earth do you bring up kids then? You don't have a word like that. So I've been using that word, tupli, traki, another one, virk, virk and traki, with my granddaughter. And I'm finding that their use alters indeed the behavior. So language has distinctions, but it chunks an experience, kind of picks out things as we did with the rabbit pellets in the moss. And then I looked at how do I, do I translate one of these words, like traki, for example. I can look it up and it means kind of brisk, kind of smart, but not quite exactly that. And if I look up brisk in the dictionary, it has meanings such as traki, germas, virka, vilkas, ela, vedavunt, erguta, but none of them are quite exactly. They all kind of talk about the edges of brisk. And I could do that, take another one, germas, and find different parts of English in the yellow that speak about part of it, and so on and so forth. And I can find that different languages take our field of experience and create domains or kind of centers of attraction or distinction that give us meanings of words in different ways. What's really relevant here is that the English meaning ready doesn't have quite the same core equivalent in Estonian. None of those words are quite it. And similarly, Raki is quite missing in English, even though you might talk about it, brisk, lively, or smart. It just doesn't quite of a pair. There are betweens in what any language distinguishes. And that fits back with Maturana said every distinction reveals a regularity and obscures others. So regularities are kind of what we pick out of a continuum. So that brings me to think about the next bit. What do we do when we language? And that refers to another of Maturana's statements that I find very important in my life to ask what do I do when I do whatever I do when I do what I do what do we do when we're languaging and for that he had a particular language answer that language is a matter that arises as a recursion in consensual coordination and that we learn language embedded in language so we take it for granted we are like fish living in a medium that don't see that which we're meeting in as a language with our human niche. So I'm using slides that some of you will have seen before because it's kind of become my vocabulary, my visual vocabulary, how I explain things. And each time I explain, they're a little bit in a different context. So consensual coordination is something that we see among many, many species. Animals do it, we do it. When we're walking out on the crossing of a sidewalk, or intersection. We don't have to think about you go left, I go right. We just do it. We just move easily without bumping into another because we're consensually coordinating. Now this consensual coordination, a particular form of it can happen over and over and over again until it takes on a kind of a presence because the pattern has become a pattern that we can distinguish and recognize as happening. And once that's recognized, and I should have said become aware of rather than distinguish, because I want to keep distinction in particular meaning, we have a kind of token. And I've not just us, other animals do this too. A token can be a sound, a gesture, or a movement, or in various things. Could be a smell in other animals. With us, it's usually not that. And the token coordinates behavior in a way that obscures what was underlying it. But this token can happen also with recurring ease. So like my dog, Cindy, was able to recognize a token of a sticky, but for that, for her, it meant the game of throwing and catching. It wasn't the object stick. I could ask, find a stick, and she would go bring something to play with. But for us, 
eventually that token it persists as presence, it becomes the possibility of a new recursion, another consensual coordination. And this is really interesting because once we've done that, we've kind of taken a mental step away from the original reference, and now we have a named object. We, distinguishing and naming is what happens when you do this three times recursions on one, top, one on top of another, and we have a named object, a thing, an action idea. Now, I haven't noticed animals doing this, though they do a lot of languaging with just the tokens, but we can do this in a way that's different. We can uh, use this outside the original context. We can tell a story of what happened or what might happen. We can make plans because we are able to uh, conserve the meaning outside of the situation where it makes sense. So we can make a lot more with language. And that's how we have made a richness. Because each time you have a distinction, it can proliferate. A distinction can have kind of create an ecosystem almost, or a lineaging, an evolution of further meanings. And furthermore, we can take that distinction into some other domain of behavior. You can take something from math and use it in daily life, or you can use something from daily life and use it in the in the business setting. And it takes on a different meaning. It's not quite the same anymore. And each of these can lead to further ideas and further words. So we end up having a rich proliferation of words, as indeed we do. And we do not see the process of the history that went into the creating these things as if they are things, these named objects. And I mean by objects, even things like actions, like running becomes as if a thing. What is relevant here is that the distinctions, except in the culture, influence how the people see and how they act which has an influence on the kind of culture the world derives it for them, which validates the distinctions, so of course they're real. It becomes a circular thing. I could also say the language accepted in the culture validates the language in the culture. So language influences our experience. And let's go back to these words, tupli and traki. In English, what we would say when a kid does something well, a child, good job. In Estonian, I would say, dubli. And you might notice that one of them is referring to the, with the, to the result, what they have done, the tensions on the result. The other one is referring to the doing, and in particular, a manner of being, a kind of mood, because dubli is, a, if I was trying to translate, it would be saying a joy in competence. It's, I see you're happy in your competence, is what you're saying when you say dubli. When you're saying good job, you say, wow, you did, you, what you did resulted in this. And you can see how those two cultures can diverge, one being much more uh, thing oriented, the, much, the other being much more attitude oriented. Not fully, of course, but there's a, a sort of a bias that I think is important. So thinking about those distinctions and what we do, language is also very flexible. When we looked at some of these words, let's look at them closer. Each of them had a variety of meanings. That was why we could translate parts of them to other languages. And if you look at this set of possible meanings for any word, it could be going in various different meanings. There's a kind of a, a possibility, set of possibilities where you go with the word, that it means different things in different situations, contexts, and domains of behavior. And here I mean meaning as a possible adjacent behavior or con and the consequence of that. So meaning in this sense is what can come next. 
let's say if you had, we're going with that pink meaning, you had those possibilities, but in any one instance, you'll be going through a particular one. And similarly, the yellow one, all those possibilities, but in any one instance, your conversation would flow along one path or another. It would be generative. It's not necessarily all there, which is <laughs> implied by the figure. It's meant to say differences. And this was true also. The word system, when I speak it, may not be the same as what you mean. I may be talking purple and you may be talking green. Or systems thinking, that's another phrase that's heard very differently and has the possibility of different meanings or design meanings for that matter. And of course, this entangled word that become prominent in this particular conference, which I'm finding to be a delightful word. So again, Maturana's statement here is listen for the domain in which what the other says is valid. Figure out where they are coming from. Think like they do, and maybe you will understand. Not that, not that, maybe that, oh no, not that, or that, no. Ah, uh, this is what they meant. Then you can follow through together. So I do this a lot. I show you pictures, but what I intend with them is a poiesis of understanding that you would generate from yourself. And I use this as a visual metaphor. And that metaphors, we all have lots of them. Here I can think of metaphor, we are like chefs with words. We compose our language and the result depends on more than the ingredients we use in the sense that different chefs using the same ingredients, a few different people using the same words can get rather different results. So metaphor reminds us that how we do what we do matters. That particular metaphor. Another metaphor I like is the metaphor of flow, a flow in language, where you notice that the small the divergence in any moment can have a large consequence. Whoops, e missing in consequence. So I can think of words as objects in the stream influencing the flow and move by the flow and shape by over time. So the flow can change the words, the meaning of the words, and the words change the meaning of the flow. The flow would be the language. So if they're haphazardly located, now it's hard to get any particular meaning. So the small divergences can have consequence. Let's say you've arranged them carefully in a sentence, a way of saying, oh, but not all of the meanings came right through. Some people got something different. Let's rearrange it. Let's do it this way. Ah, a lot more goes in the right direction. And I can take a conversation here. David's speaking with his friend, Robbie. They're talking about something and David's meaning goes astray and he listens. And okay, maybe Robbie meant this word differently. Let's explain my use of this word. And then maybe the flow can go so that much more coherent we understand mutually. Now there are cultural differences. So let's say in the culture that word doesn't even exist at the same. So no matter how you try and explain it to coordinate it, it just isn't possible to get the flow the way it was meant to be. So language as a flow of recursive and recurrent coordinations of consensual coordinate happens within the context. And we can design our conversations for our consensual coordination. We speak in a way that we think the listener will understand. What is implicit in here is uh, Fry's notion from his keynote is that our designs design us. But I will come back to that because it's dependent on how we're structurally coupled and how we are entangled at the same time. I have this, it's actually a physical object. I know if any of you are seeing it, but I don't know if you can see, oops, it's upside down. My vision, I only have the display on my monitor. So I feel like I'm speaking <laughs> into the ether, but I believe there's people there. Anyway, this little thing, thing is a Maturana idea. And I will explain it more here. We have a living system connoted by that circular arrow going around, which means it's composing itself, what we know as auto molecular autopoiesis. And it is also in a relational domain. It's acting with its environment and sensing its environment. 
And there's an eco-social domain, which is that environment or the medium, which is changing as you act and sense that you sense the changes. And the living system in its cognitive domain is making coherence out of it. It's doing sensory effective coordination. So that's how Maturana calls living systems as cognitive systems. They are cognitive systems, even bacteria are. And living for any system happens in continuous circularity, in a continuous flow. This part of the circularity, that connection between the being and its medium is what's called structural coupling. As one changes the other, the other, they each change each other in this coupling of its structural changes that happen. Internally, of course, more of the, the changes in the living system are not visible externally. They are largely changes in our cognition. And all of this together, both the medium and the, and the living system act in adaptation. It's a constant. It's an ongoing adaptive process. Now I said I would come back to Fry's statement and then I'm going to call it cohering. Whatever is design, design's design. And it's not, if I try and parse it in this particular model framework, let's say you have an idea for a design and you implement it and it goes into the medium and then the medium, it starts becoming something that is used. It will alter how we, any me, the designer or any other human senses the medium, thus changing the designer, the person. Designing designs us. And further, it, it ends up being a full circularity. So the changes in the medium uh, are coherent in this adaptive thing. So as we design our media, we are designing ourselves. And I found that this very inspiring. If you have, I don't know if I've got the full implications of that. I know I don't have the full implications of that here, but it's worth going to his keynote. And then I want to enlarge this a bit and think about what is there that's happening. So there is language and our rational thinking, that which we usually refer to as thinking. But there's also a systemic cognition under that. And I will enlarge on that in the next section. But these two are also in a mutual affecting of each other, a circularity. So the language influences our systemic cognition, our systemic cognition influences language. And it's all co also connected and recursion with the rest of our bodyhood. So there's the internal systemic that is through the structural coupling in resonance with the external, which is also a systemic, not just a, a solid tangible medium. And that there is, though this is relevant for both the development of an individual and it is relevant through evolution. Now, I want to be clear that this external thing is much more complicated than just a uh, medium that is persistent, because for one thing, it includes other living systems that may or may not have language and are also in, in connection with the medium, some of them directly in connection with others, with us, and some of them not. And all this too is taking place in the constant flow of changes. So systemic, dynamic, relational embeddedness, or in the terms of this conference, a systemic, dynamic, relational entanglement in ways we don't entirely see, yet somehow we do sense of it. And I think Beasley's comment here is the sheer coherence of everything. Oops, I probably moved my monitor off myself. So on with systemic cognition, that bit in the picture that I hadn't really talked about, that internal systemic and resonance with external. So looking at it more, closely zooming in on it, so to speak. Cognition is a systemic dynamic that evolved congruently with the complex relational dynamic that is embedded in. So it has a kind of resonance with it. And it is hard to speak of it because either hyperdimensional or perhaps not dimensional, dull, a-dimensional. But I tried to represent it with linkings and networks and so on. I like the presentation that Beasley had where he made some of this more 
dynamic. He had movies, but I've just a screenshot and have with his permission used it here. That this is our unspeakable, well, unspeakable deep emplacement. And of that, I can think of a resonance that happens in what I call our systemic cognition. Eisen called it, Ray Eisen, is our systemic sensibility. But I'll keep to systemic cognition just for simplicity, simplicity here. And it is our essential and consensual coordination as we are within our medium. We do this all within our systemic cognition and it gives us a richness of our systemic coherence with everything we're connected with. But it doesn't bound us very much. For bounding, we need to be more precise uh, of what we are going to respond to. And that's where the thinking that has developed through oral language has given us a kind of a increase in the bounding and possibly, probably a decrease in systemic coherence. Because here we have the coordination of coordinations, distinguishing and naming, and all those other further recursions in language. And this, of course, is connected with our systemic cognition. So think a language influences systemic cognition, systemic cognition influences language. But from that, we have done something more. We have developed the kind of thinking that's based on text, on symbols and abstractions, all kinds of formalized procedures and models and that bounds our potential response even more and also narrows the systemic coherence. So we have precision and certainty. We have rules of logic. And that's, of course, linked to language. It remains coherent with the logic of language. Otherwise, we'd never be able to get there. A little outside here is that we learn our native language. We basically start bottom up. We start with systemic cognition and eventually develop uh, the abstract thinking of symbols and text. When we teach a foreign language, we often start with the text and the symbols, the language, the words and the currents, and it doesn't always make it down to thinking, uh, the thinking that you would have an oral language or a systemic cognition until we become native speakers by speaking it enough that we know it in the situation. But I'm going back to this. And one of the things I can do with it is create a proper graph of the richness of systemic cognition, the bounding of potential response, and talk about its capacity for coordination of multiple domains, more in systemic than in written, and the capacity for liability, which is more in written language. And well, those look a little chunky. So let's make them more probability functions. That feels better. Now I can speak of it as, as if it was, and I have, think I published about this as it well, as a graph. But, but this is where I start to wonder, what have I done? Have I not put that whole thing that's meant to be systemic and oral into the domain of abstract thinking and language? I have formalized an aspect of systemic understanding. And what have I obscured with these distinctions? here, oh dear. So, but I'll drop it and then go swimming on. And when we're navigating between domains, we think of language as modulates our consensual coordination and the flow of living together. So back to this rich dynamic and fractal scintillating medium that Beasley spoke of, and here's a kind of fractured aspect of one of his images. And the, here is the systemic cognition that rises coherently with it. But I'm going to make it a little simpler as I talk about it, even though they are in recursion. And just take the systemic cognition and talk about what comes out of it. Language, of course, arises out of it. Oral language. Oh, and have you had this idea that you can just kind of sense something in some on the tip of your tongue? Eventually, ah, you get the words for it. It's an atom. In language, we can make distinctions. We have words, and that which was kind of on the tip of our tongue we're trying to think of, now we can distinguish it. And we can make relations, specify relationships amongst it. This thinking was ephemeral, that the ideas that occur to us, they might be like those little images that we're blinking on and off until we capture it in language. 
and then we can socially conserve it. But further, when we write and formalize that, we are not made it even more durable and it's conserved externally to us, external to our social because it can be manuscripts, papers, and diagrams and things that are durable beyond the conversations that are happening in our own language. This externally reference durability takes on a sense of validity and we have a tendency to call it reality even. It's a construct written out of our deep systemic cognition. It's the text I never forgot or sometimes don't take into account the context that con with the text and that's all the other stuff. So when we're talking about context, I think we're taking that into account, that deeper thing. And this might be the emergence, that which comes out to be as talked of as words and ideas and spoken and shared and made into formalizations, but it doesn't include all the entanglement. So I would uh, hazard to say that in oral language, we're probably also entangled <laughs> in a complex way. So maybe the entanglement is the blue and the green, and the emergence is the yellow and the green. Then, oh, one thing that can happen here is we can make or give precedence to our formalizations and let them grow and make the language and conversations talk about them to the extent that we drop our systemic cognition. That is abstraction to the extreme and I think that can dehumanize us, but I don't think we do that very much. I think what we do more is shift our current attention among these different, sometimes in language, sometimes in systemic thinking, sometimes going up to the text and context, and we kind of overflowing of our focus, do tie it all together. So I'm going to come close to a concluding here by pointing out that meaning arises in my mind, the perception of it as a reflective experience in the flow of living when we sense a harmony among all the relationships we are aware of. A flow in language evokes a flow among relationships, and it's that harmony on that flow that gives us a sense of meaning. Or, as Alexander Kravchenko said, meaning is our relationship to a relationship. This is a photo he sent from his homeland. He lives in Irtusk in Soviet Union. And I recommend, if you're interested in language, some of his works as well. So I've been showing it as singular, as if we had an even substrate. But there are actually, if you look at different people in different contexts, they will abstract out of that deep systemic engagement various domains of more attention. It's not like we're all the same in this, it's, though it may come from the same fundamental basis. There are, what should I call it? <laughs> densities, I could say. The densities are more engagement. And out of these, different conversations can arise. And these could be different domains of uh, our actions, or it could be very different places and different languages in the world. But let's think of it in the domains of action. There are different conversations that come. And in some of these conversations, we may create formalities, conceptual frameworks and models. Again, I'm gonna simplify by looking at two at once. Now, what if we have two different ones? And if I was doing this in system sciences rather than design, I could have named a number of different methodologies or approaches or theories. And if we try and describe one in terms of the other, we're bound to kind of distort it to try and make it fit. So I don't like that much. I would prefer that what we do is actually expand our conversations so that in our conversations, we bring them together. And I'm not sure this is the adaptive consciousness that Tony Fried spoke to, but I think it would apply here in any case, that as you adapt your conversations, you can see how 
something may be relevant to you in another domain or the other framework. So we can take these frameworks and conversations together and call them methodologies. And then how we do what we do becomes relevant again, because that is where we can bring in the systemic cognition to what I could think of as peripheral conception and cognition or vision that you kind of feel something nagging you and you, then you tend to it and it comes into focus, into awareness. So that influences also how we do what we do when they're in our methodologies and frameworks. And perhaps the image that feels this better is Beasley's being aware of everything around us and not being afraid or constricted or barriered ourselves. So thus we can have richness of systemic coherence, bounding of the potential of response, increase our capacity for co coordinations among multiple domains, while also maintaining a capacity reliability and for management. So I guess I kind of summarize that most of what I want to talk about at central to it all, I think is working in a complex world, where letting our awareness be attuned to it and let it influence how we do what we do. So I would conjecture in that, that whether we integrate our various forms of thinking depends on how how we do what we do, how we live in our language and niche. We have a choice. And I can also say we can live in this systemic relational engagement, entanglement, engage in conversation, as well as benefit from conceptual and formal models and framework. It's all a matter of how we do what we do, and that is our choice. So, I think I would say that language modulates our relationship, the flow of structural coupling with each other, with our eco-social medium, and internally within ourselves, all the way down. And this is kind of a desire. I mean, it's my desire. I would like us our humans to remain the kind of beings who live in reflexive awareness of our relational entanglement through text, oral language, and our systemic cognition as we practice design. Thank you. And I do welcome conversation. Have I stopped screen sharing? Thank you so much for sharing your your reflections and the, these beautiful images to to accompany your your thoughts. I, I hope I didn't push through it too fast. I cannot see uh, everyone in the participant uh, window. So if you have a question or a reflection, just uh, jump in uh, because I uh, I won't be able to see any raised hands. And you can also use the, the chat to, to write uh, thoughts or, or questions uh, that might uh, occur to you as the conversation goes on. Excuse me, have I successfully stopped screen sharing? Uh, you have not, as far as I can see. And for some reason, I actually can't stop it for you. Oh. Which is also unusual. And I, I don't <laughs> have... My colleagues can help you. Yeah. If, uh, if you try sharing a different screen, it should stop, and then you can stop that one. <laughs> and we'll be able to see each other larger, I think. Yeah, that should... Are we should back? Be... Oh, there you are. Yeah. Um. Do we want to uh, just go to the gallery view or do you want to stay uh, the spotlight? I don't need to stay in the spotlight and I <laughs> put gallery view on one screen is the one I'm looking at. Yeah. There we go. Mm -hmm. So are there questions or comments or?
I could do a question. Please, Ben. Yeah. Um, hi, Pele. Um, so thank you so much. And I guess I am going to uh, invite you to um, apply one of your uh, starting points to your own talk. So um, the, you know, one of the things you had at the start was that um, distinctions, um, you know, they hi highlight something and they obscure something else. Mm -hmm. And one of the distinctions that appears early on in your talk is to talk about certain things in terms of language. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, you know, and you could choose other words for that other than language. And I was wondering what you thought that revealed and obscured. Uh, it's a kind of um, catch-22 there. I can't talk about language without using language. So uh, <laughs> I, uh, I am indeed trapped in that. But if I were with you, we would have a sense, I mean, physically in the same place. And then I glance over there and you glance over there, you'd be looking out the same window and that we would be having a coordination that was not in language as along with our language. And even now on the screen, I have a sense of uh, not only a history of many conversations with you, but uh, a sense, an emotion of trust, because I, I've always uh, uh, appreciated you. And then the sense of what you're saying, and this is not in language. And here I am trying to point to it in language, but yet as I do that, I have had to specify particular words like trust, and you probably all hear that somewhat differently and don't know what I mean in the context of this conversation, though Ben is the one most likely to guess what I mean in terms of him specifically. <laughs> so indeed, it is a catch-22. Thanks, Ben. Uh, yeah. Marie? Yeah. Uh, hello, thanks for a great talk. I'm wondering just like, you know, how much uh, specifically then you mentioned the experience with nice conversations with them and so on. I'm wondering how much of the language is actually the voice and the uh, nice, uh, you know, nice mood. Uh, uh, you know, like if somebody you can say the same sentence and get it completely different because uh, it can be said nicely or rudely. Uh, uh, so I, I'm wondering how much like when you discuss between the two languages, like whether, whether the conversation can be also done through this, uh, through this like, um, Empathetic mm -hmm. conversation or voice conversation. <laughs> yes, 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 very much so. I mean, there's a dimension that I, like, let's say I was talking about the English, good job example. I could say, good job, or <laughs> good, good, good job, or good job. <laughs> no, <laughs> you can, the intonation of your voice adds so much meaning. And that's there in the oral conversation, but not there in the text. Yeah. And so that's why oral conversation and all my pictures, I had it much wider. And in that width, it doesn't mean that you're spread out through it. That's just the possibilities of where you can be in it. And in any situation, the more congruent you are with your listener, you're in the, between the listener and the speaker, or even the even confounding the two, the the more coherent you feel, you feel an intimacy. Like I I feel your very question implied to me a close intimacy with having seen and and thought about this. It's not new to you. No. No. You you think that you haven't thought about it? I thought you haven't thought about it. No. 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 no I, you have been thinking about it. Yeah, you ever listening to me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have been uh, thinking about it by listening. Yeah. Yes, and it, I recognize that because otherwise you wouldn't have asked the question the way you asked it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Howard. 
Hi, Pile. Thanks so much. I'm, I'm just struck by your reiteration of, of good job and uh, Hubli, if I if I have it correct. I, w I wonder if you could um, elaborate. Um, are there kind of r ramifications or correspondences in the cultures that you see in in the way in which good job reflects um, an English or or North American or something you know personality versus um, the Estonian uh, uh, youth uh, and the the way that's um, instantiated in in this uh, uh, this word to believe. Yes, I, I have a lot of thinking along that way. One of the things is that, that take into account is Estonian is a First Nation in the sense that it's uh, the peoples have been on the same land for 10,000 years since the glaciation, and which is true of the North American First Nations as well. So the language evolved out of that culture and out of that it is an old language. And of course it is mutated as well. But in the last... Uh, century or in the, even a little longer, it's been strongly influenced by other peoples who have lived there. And Swedes, the Germans, the, and the Russians have all had an influence. So the culture is no longer completely the same, even though it retains some of the old words. And hence, there is a kind of globalization that happens with each language that is currently connected now with other languages. And, but English also rose as a trade language. So there was a tendency for it to be more specific, more, uh, more thing oriented, because that's what you were doing with trade is be, being clear and specific. And Estonian as well has a grammar that is inherently relational. All nouns occur in the declension that indicates like there's 16 declensions and indicate its relationship to whatever thing is happening. So on the table, under the table, through the table, from the table, all are different. Laut, lawale, lawal, lawani. They are. They all have uh, the verb that uh, noun cannot be said except with relationship. And of course, there's limited ones, but there are nuances come. So yes, languages uh, retain some differences. But in the globalization, those differences are eroding. And as a, the, was a, Marie was just saying, it also depends on the instance of its use. So in English, I could actually use the word good job in a way that referred in the understanding to the person doing the job more clearly. But the words have a pull towards the objective towards the material, because there's an influence of that, which pull is not possible in Dubli. It's just, it's just, in focus it back to the person. You are versus you do. A being to doing change. That's adequate? Prashant, am I saying your name right? Um, hi, yes, it's correct. Thank you. Um, first of all, very nice um, presentation and talk. Uh, let me just try. Yeah. So it is more of a follow-up because my original question was something related to um, English poly English language pro proliferation on other languages um, with more modern terms, which essentially mean the same more in terms of like objects and everything um, in Japanese like computer is called similarly in Japanese just translated um, as an example. Um, so one of the things that come to mind is also like the culture um, in which like English is also flourishing. One of them is the digital internet yes. in general. Yes. Um, and how, I mean, all of it is just data, right? And most of the data is existing in English. Even the code that we write is in English. Um, and it derives 
um, it derives the words as syntaxes in some terms, like suppose like if else from uh, and things like those. Um, I won't go into the details. So how does, is there a way that the digital data can be multicultural? Is my question. I don't know. This is something where I am starting to feel old. I'm starting to feel that I'm losing touch with the digital changes with the chat GPT and so on. And uh, I'm feeling my concern is that I find it sufficiently distasteful that I am not that I'm not learning about enough to find the value in it either. And so I there is definitely an influence, and I think it's more up to your generation to work that out. And I don't want to be opting out and not want you to be opting out. It's more a matter that I feel incompetent when we come to this era. I have not risen enough out of it. I can master Zoom and, <laughs> and text and so on, but this is starting to feel beyond me. So I'm sorry, I'm not answering your question properly. Yeah. It's, it's fine, I understand it. Yeah. It's, yeah, I'm embarrassed. Yeah. Ashley. Please don't be. Please don't. Ethan? And I do have a, a comment to your question, Prashant. So. Uh, so, Helen, why don't you make your comments? And then Ashley's hand was up before mine, so we'll let her go first. Um, okay, so the, 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 the comment is that even if you look at things like uh, mathematics or physics, where you... Some people argue that there is a, a shared international language uh, because the the symbols and the uh, are um, so simple and the the rules for uh, co combining them are uh, so standardized and also so simplified. Uh, you you actually see extremely different ways of uh, understanding and and using and working uh, with mathematics or with uh, the physics, which are culturally de determined and, of course, also be based on experience and what we want to do and how we relate to to each other to ourselves to the world uh, 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 etc so uh, I, I think that there is um, a drive to to globalize and to to bring some form of conformity in what we are allowed to think and do through and express and communicate uh, but the, the the differences in our position in the world and our experiences and our culture uh, are are there uh, despite the 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 conforming forces uh, of globalization. So that that would be my answer to that, and that also goes for the the latest uh, technological de developments of which there is much talk. I'm going to add a bit to that as well. I have had the feeling that in recent years, in the last four, five, six years, there has been an increase within the system societies and perhaps in the design group too, of being willing to add more complexity, which means all more localization also to the way we think and do. It's there in the desire to have more conversations amongst different people and listen to what they mean in their worlds. Please, Ashley, let's go on. Hi. Um, something, something I've been thinking on a lot lately is how um, language influences behavior or interpretations. So, for example, um, in kind of designing for systems change, you know, there's this fear of letting go with what's familiar and leaning into change or the potential for what's, what's to come, um, or what might be created and kind of playing with the words like mystery instead of, um, ambiguity or something where you kind of come into it with, um, curiosity and instead of fear, um, 
And another thing that I've been thinking on, like since reading um, Braiding Sweetgrass, is that kind of proportion of verbs in a language versus nouns and that being based on values. And I'm really curious about like if English can shift or how quickly it can shift into kind of changing, um, kind of doing the reverse, like changing our language and how we use our words um, to affect our values um, in our society. I don't know that I have a specific question, but I'm curious kind of your, your thoughts on some of those things. (laughs) <laughs> I feel like I have so many thoughts that they're bouncing with each other wondering which one to come forth but I've uh, I've liked your choice of mystery rather than ambiguity because most people hear ambiguity with uh, distaste whereas mystery can be more invitational but I When I think of ambiguity as a dance between possibilities, uh, then I see it, I can dance with that. And then dancing brings on the the pleasurable aspect again. But but it is this necessity, I think, of having, being aware that we cannot know everything, that we can only comfortably get some signals and that's why the comfortably I think matters that we don't get scared and say we don't know anything and then go back into wanting a certitude and boxing ourselves in it's to to trust ourselves to trust our deep history of evolution that we are complex beings and that we are now creating a world that we didn't evolve in but we are evolving with it and that's kind of where I was saying that I'm getting older (laughs) I don't think that's a very satisfactory answer for you. I think we need more conversation. Evan, you had your hand up too. Uh, so first, Pile, the, the AI stuff makes me feel old too. So I wouldn't sweat it too hard. <laughs> and I guess, so I guess the, the thing I want to ask you about is... Um, this idea that maybe there's something fundamental about our experience of our bodies that is cross-cultural and um, and somehow really interwoven with the way that we develop language. And so, um, like, I if I stub my toe, I need to sort of vocalize something, right? And I feel like that is a cross-cultural experience. And, like, as we start to layer things on top of that vocalization, we develop something that looks more like language. But what about this idea that there is a fundamental embodied experience that we all must share by being in bodies that lets us sort of understand some of the language that we're using sort of innately? I, I agree. I, people who do practice a body awareness technique find that they can bring a diverse group of people together very easily in recognizing we are all, after all, we each have similar structure in our bodies. None of us have a, the legs of a doe or a, the arms of a rabbit, you know, and so, and the, our whole biology has evolved as such. And we are all, as Maturana said also, we are all equally intelligent. We just evolve differently in how that manifests and what we may have encountered up to now in our lives. So it's not intelligent, that's experience. And uh, so, yes, this embodied awareness, I think is is really fundamental. And yeah, there, there's metaphors even. In most, uh, most languages, I think this is uh, metaphors we live by, who was the author, mentioned that down is a metaphor used in many languages because down is when we're sleeping and up is when we're alert. So that that metaphor finds its way into different cultures because it is grounded in our bodyhood and how we act. So that's probably an interesting route to remember that we, in fact, we recognize other humans as human because they are.
Helen, you're the moderator. You don't have to raise your own hand. I do because there are several people who have uh, questions, ideas, thoughts, and uh, <laughs> and whatever. Uh, I, I mean, I, I I really like your takeaway of having uh, conversations uh, because if we just leave things as I don't know, uh, diagrams or uh, formalized representations, they, they are frozen and conversations uh, allows us to, uh, to benefit and to, to co-develop and to, to collectively become maybe a bit wiser or uh, able to deal with whatever we have to deal with. Uh, but, but I would like to get back to, to, to the question uh, uh, of experience, because mm -hmm. we do share uh, the experience of being human beings, of having our body uh, pain if we stub our toe and, uh, and so on, and everything we're, which being human entails. But we are uh, placed in very different positions uh, on this planet. and in our life courses maybe and so, so really uh, besides being engaged in collective action which is uh, a context where we develop this uh, coherence and uh, coordinated um, uh, uh, action and ability to act and understand and um, and expand our um, uh, our horizons. Uh, also, really, I think uh, looking for experiences that will uh, expand our horizons it's important because uh, if you have only had experiences mediated through narratives. Uh, there is a disconnect, whereas if you've had, if you've even touched one of your uh, fuzzy blobs uh, with a toe somewhere, or uh, it has nudged you, or you've felt it sort of passing and your your hair, is, at least you can connect to it, and through connecting, your imagination, your empathy, etc., um, and bringing in other experiences that you've had. It allows the, the, the communication. So uh, conversations and expanding our uh, our actual experiences, I think, is uh, is important in different ways. Yes. I used to teach environmental management at Royal Roads University, and that as a pre-course essay, I asked the students to write about their ontogeny as an environment. In other words, how did they get to be be in this course, what what in their life led to it? And almost everybody began with concrete experiences as a child of living in some natural area or exploring a ravine or going camping and so on, that this embodied experience within the natural world was what gave the rise for the possibility of ever becoming interested in that dimension. So I, that's one of the things that concerns me about urban life is how are we going to have enough substantive embodied experience in the rest of the world besides our, our structures if we all live only in that so that without providing that experience what do we how do we expect people to love nature if they don't know it and i think that's just one dimension of it so the mention of uh, personal relationships also matters we had close trusting relationships that leads to that idea that you your th thoughts brought to me was we haven't talked about emotions emotions that i mean i referred to it when i talked about trust with uh, ben but the this whole idea that we are emotional beings as well as uh, thinking beings or that we the emotions that we elicit and live in may also vary by culture, at least how we name them, but there is a fundamental need to be open 
to each other to even begin to see each other. And that is a, a, an emotional orientation. Matrana called it love, the acceptance of the other in the whole existence with it, yourself without them having to legitimize or prove themselves. <laughs> so we've run a bit over time. Um, if everyone feels like they've got their questions answered, then I think it might be time to say goodbye until the next session. And you're welcome to continue asking via email if you so wish. Thank you thank so you. much, Philip. Thank, thank you, everybody. Thank you. thank you, Helen. So good to thank see you. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Philip. Thank you, Evan. Thank you, Ella. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye.